you who don't know me, my name's Roger Partridge and I'm chairman of the New Zealand Initiative. I'm, I haven't, um, in, the, in the first four years of the initiative's life, um, been down in Wellington all that much, but this year I've become a part-time member of the research team and I'm down here one day a week, uh, something I'm enjoying very much. Um, for this year's first initiative at home, we thought we'd unleash our own executive director on his favourite topic, Europe. <laughs> Um, if you, the, uh, any of you who don't know Oliver, uh, he's been executive director of the initiative for now nearly four years. Before that he worked in think tanks in Australia and in the UK. You might ask um, why um, is he so down on Europe? It is after all the continent of his birthplace. Um, he tells us that it's not just that familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> Uh, his criticism stems uh, from what he sees as systemic failings in the European project. Over the last six years, he has published with, um, you might say, monotonous regularity, nearly 300 articles on Europe's failings in his weekly column in the Business Spectator. And last year, for us, he authored a, a short book on on why Europe failed, and um, autographed copies of the book are available later this evening for $25. Um, after uh, Europe's string of failures, uh, I like that string of failures when we're talking about the end of Europe. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, tonight's topic is appropriate. So I'll hand you over to Oliver to talk about the end of EU road. Oliver. Thank you, Roger, for this very kind introduction. Good evening. It's uh, quite surprising to see so many of you here because when we advertised the event, I thought how much interest could there be in New Zealand in European affairs anymore? Why would anyone really want to talk about this? But you're all here and it could have been such a nice evening. <laughs> and now you're hearing about Europe. For those of you who have read some of my columns over the past six years, as Roger mentioned, writing weekly columns as um, the world's only New Zealand-based Europe correspondent, um, you would know that I'm a quite a Eurosceptic, but then again you might say that's only to be expected because after all I'm German and I'm an economist and I leave it to you to decide what's worse. <laughs> but. Uh, we have to talk about Europe, unfortunately, um, whether we like it or not, because the continent is really in crisis. And if you don't believe it now, you'll hopefully believe it after my presentation. But we should just go back a few years and think back maybe 10, 11 years when all of these books were published. I've only selected three titles. They were all published around 2005, 2006. One told us why Europe will run the 21st century. The other one talked about the European dream and how it would all eclipse America. Another book fantasized about the United States of Europe and why Europe will really break American supremacy. Well, that is so 2005 now, isn't it? Um, the books published these days sound more like that. So After the Fall by Walter Lacour, a really good book. It's actually the sequel to his uh, book, The Last Days of Europe. You kind of wonder how it's possible to write a sequel to something called The Last Days of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, that's Walter Lacour. It's a great book. Then there is uh, Europe's deadlock, how the Euro crisis could be solved and why it won't happen. David Marsh, great book. My favorite one is, of course, why Europe failed. You can get uh, copies for $25 and if I sign them, you get them for $20. Um, <laughs> and I really like that one, uh, not just because I'm on first name terms with the author. Um, so basically the mood has changed. We have all heard about the Euro crisis. We've heard about mm -hmm. Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal and the debt crisis. So some of the things are well known and quite familiar really after all of these years of Euro crisis. I mean, how many bailout packages for Greece does it need for us to realize that there is a bit of a problem there? Um, but there are some new developments in Europe, more recent developments that I think will turn this Euro crisis into a much more systemic crisis for the whole continent. And I'm going to talk about that and I will explain why this is not just deja vu, not just more of Greece and more of bailout and more of quantitative easing and more of you know, uh, sovereign debt crisis, but it's actually a much more fundamental crisis for Europe 
and why this might even be the end of Europe or EU ROP or however we might pronounce that. Just to start off though, I think we should just recap what are the fundamental problems facing Europe. I think by now we have all realized that there are some institutional problems with Europe. The EU structure is simply not fit for purpose and I'm writing about this in my essay. The European Union of course started in the 1950s with just six countries. They were quite homogenous in, in themselves. So we had um, Germany or West Germany at the time, Italy, France and the Benelux countries. Now we are talking about a European Union of 28 member countries and they are quite diverse in themselves. It's a very heterogeneous organization these days which, which makes it very difficult to find any common ground and any uh, solutions to Europe's many challenges. Economic reasons of course are playing a massive role in Europe and I just want to give you one figure. Europe currently depending on how you measure it, has about 8-9% uh, of the world's population. The member states of the European Union are just under 500 million people, but together they account for 55% of the world's social welfare spending. Now that's not quite sustainable, it's reflected in high tax rates, it's reflected in low growth rates, so there are certainly some structural economic reasons why Europe is not doing too well. Monetary policy reasons, do I really have to tell much about the Euro crisis? This was a monetary union that was never supposed to happen. It happened for political reasons, it never worked economically and it's a complete disaster and a lot of economists of course predicted that exactly when it was started. Finally there are demographic reasons which uh, um, explain why Europe is in trouble and why it's only going to get worse. My favorite statistic really to sum up Europe's demographic problems, the aging of Europe is um, if you're looking at the median age in Italy and Germany it's currently somewhere between 44 and 45 years. So half the population under that age, half the population over that age there's only one country in the world that's older than these two countries and that's Vatican City. That's not quite a role model to follow. So really we have a lot of problems of a structural fundamental nature in Europe and none of this has really changed over the last few years and um, if um, that was all my, my, my talk was about we wouldn't have to be here tonight because you would all know about that. But I think when we're talking about Europe in 2016 there are a few things that are really new and that have changed. So the current crisis is not just a deja vu of what we've just experienced. So I want to give you three reasons why I think this EU crisis is really different. The first reason is linked to the previous crises. The European Union is structurally weakened by all these years of dealing with these problems, especially with the Euro crisis. It has absorbed a lot of political energy, of political capital dealing with these challenges and the European Union barely has had hard time to deal with anything else. It hasn't really made itself more competitive. I mean that was the great plan of course when they came together for the Lisbon agenda more than a decade ago. They wanted to be the most competitive region in the world. Well it hasn't really happened uh, because they were just too busy with other things. Um, in the first instance uh, just averting sovereign bankruptcies. The second reason I think why this crisis is different is because for the first time really in the European Union's history we have a proper referendum on whether a country really wants to remain a member and that's Britain. Um, we had other referenda of course in the European Union's history but um, as you know typically these referenda work um, in a way that a country first gives the answer that it really wants to give then there's pressure exerted and then they have a second chance to get it right for the uh, European Commission. Um, you can read about that in my essay as well. The third reason I think why this crisis is different, why everything is becoming even more difficult today is because of the migration crisis. So we had crises of course in the Middle East, we have the Syrian um, war and this has uh, triggered a massive movement of people towards um, Europe and Europe is simply not able to deal with it properly. So in short I think what we're seeing in Europe is a toxic mix of different crises on numerous fronts. And what I will argue tonight is that this mix of um, problems has the potential to break up the EU and even if the EU survives 2016 it will be a very different union compared to the union that we have come to know. Let's go back to the Euro crisis though, just briefly, because we shouldn't forget about it. I mean you can read the newspapers these days and you kind of think that it's all over and we had of course a bit of a Greek crisis again last year but um, in July they um, had a long meeting, I mean a really almost 24 hour meeting in Brussels and at the end of it they came to a third bailout package for Greece but that doesn't mean that the Euro crisis is over. If you just look at some of these uh, data here for European um, uh, countries, for Eurozone members, you can see that the situation is still pretty bad. Look at Greece to start with. I mean Greece when the Euro crisis started in 2009 had a debt to GDP load of 120%. Well that's 194% so hardly reassuring 
actually after five or six years now of dealing with Greece, the situation in Greece is worse than it was before, so great success. Um, it's more in debt of the country, unemployment is higher, and the economy is shrinking. Well, that the economy in Greece is shrinking is, of course, the Varoufakis effect, because Greece was actually on a relatively good path before the Syriza government took over, but they have basically destroyed any kind of um, trust in the system, and that's where Greece is today. But look at the other countries. I mean, Italy. Italy, 132% debt to GDP, doesn't quite look promising either. Look at the unemployment rates. Look at Spain, more than 20% unemployment. Spain is talked about in European circles as the growth miracle. Well, yeah, I mean, 3.5% growth is not bad. But if you take into consideration that they just had a massive contraction, they're still dealing with more than 20% unemployment, 3.5% growth is not nearly enough. And then when we're looking at um, other big countries, Italy, France, hardly any reforms taking place, despite uh, what the Italian prime minister tries to portray. Matteo Renzi talks about reforms all the time, but hardly delivers anything meaningful. And Italy certainly doesn't break out of its um, you know, half a percent, one and a half percent growth ghetto. In fact, um, Italian GDP is still lower in real terms than it was at the beginning of the crisis, and um, Italian productivity hasn't improved for 20 years. So this euro crisis is not over. And if you don't believe it, then just have a look at this graph. Um, some of you might be familiar with the European Central Bank's Target 2 mechanism. Now, Target 2 would probably take me about half a day to explain properly, but basically take it as a barometer of the euro crisis. This shows capital flight in Europe, and it's basically the position that the German Bundesbank builds up against the rest of the eurozone for allowing them to, well, let's say, print euros. So whenever Greece cannot find private capital to pay for its imports anymore, for example, they will kind of virtually create some money, and for that money that they create in Greece, the German Bundesbank gets a claim against Greece. And other European countries are doing the same. So it's basically a sign of mistrust, in the, uh, distrust in the system. And take it as a barometer of the euro crisis, you could see, of course, that it was rising rapidly in the years, um, in the first years of the euro crisis. It was kind of going down a little bit after Mario Draghi said he would do whatever it takes to control the euro crisis, but it never really completely went away. And it's recently been rising again because we now fear that there might be more troubles in the Italian banking system, for example. So I think the euro crisis is over if that balance goes back to zero. As long as it's in the hundreds of billions, um, it is not over. So this euro crisis, as I say, under wraps, not under control. It's not over. It's become chronic. It could become acute any day. But the real problems, I think, for Europe today are not just economic, they are political. The first problem is really a rise of Eurozone populism. After six years of trying to deal with this stupid, bloody Euro crisis, with failed policy after failed policy, we have really created a political atmosphere in a lot of European countries that is completely out of control. It has been a gift to populist parties on the right and on the left. And we can now see populist resistance against Eurozone bailouts in most Eurozone countries. And the resistance comes from two different camps. One camp complains about austerity being imposed on these countries. Think of Syriza in Greece. Think of the Podemos movement in Spain. Think of the Partido Socialista in, in Portugal that just won the last election. Or think of the Movimento Cinque Stelle in Italy. Uh, that's the movement that was founded by Beppe Grillo, the Italian comedian. On the other hand, well, this is quite appropriate having comedians in politics now and then. But on the other hand, there are, of course, populist movements in countries that are supporting these bailout policies and paying for them, or at least guaranteeing them. And here we are thinking about the Finns party in Finland. Until very recently, they were called the True Finns. I don't know what happened to them, whether they are any less true these days. But anyway, they're now called the Finns. And we've got the Alternative for Deutschland. That's the um, right-wing populist movement in Germany. Originally um, a respectable Eurosceptic party, but they basically split into two parties last year, and what remains is just a really nasty right-wing movement. In Austria, we've got the FPÖ, Freiheitliche Partei Österreichs, the Freedom Party, um, actually polling really strongly in the high 20% uh, in Austria. And in France, you would have all heard about the National Front, that's Marine Le Pen. Um, and um, these parties are generally resisting any bailout packages because they fear um, that it will um, um, burden their taxpayers too much. But what you can see is that this euro crisis has actually driven countries apart. It's actually led to a polarization in different countries. It has actually led to a rise of populist policies across Europe. It's not just in the eurozone, though, that we are seeing um, where we're seeing radical politics. We're seeing them in Eastern Europe as well. So we see them in Hungary, for example. Hungary has had its Prime Minister Viktor Orban for a few years now, and under Viktor Orban, 
we have seen a really nasty turn of Hungarian politics where um, Orban has continued his attacks on the freedom of the press, where he has um, uh, continued attacks on freedom of religion, where he's had to deal with an anti-Semitic coalition partner uh, and violated basic democratic principles, so not quite Western-style democracy. Slovakia, a similar movement, uh, Robert Fico, um, that's a no nominally a social democrat, has taken his lessons from Viktor Orban and is uh, basically copying his strategies it was uh, Fizzo, for example, who recently said his country wouldn't take any more Muslim migrants. Well, it's basically trying to become a European-style Donald Trump. Um, and in Poland, um, the Kaczynski party, the party of the two Kaczynski twins, um, is back in power now under a new prime minister, Beata Szydło. And again, taking um, some lessons from um, Viktor Orban, they are um, trying to turn this into a kind of a Putinesque um, country. Um, where they have attacked the um, independence of the Constitutional Court, where they have taken the state or public broadcaster under effectively the party's control. So it's, it's not quite Western-style democracy in Poland either. And these countries are cooperating. You might have seen reports in the press just over the last few days that they were celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Visegrad uh, group. That's um, Poland, Hungary, um, Slovakia and the Czech Republic united. They came together initially to work on the transformation of their countries from communist um, economies towards uh, the European Union, but they're increasingly becoming a new Eastern Bloc within the European Union. We have another problem in Europe and that's Brexit. Um, David Cameron of course promised in 2013 um, that he would hold a referendum on Britain's continued membership of the European Union. But Cameron probably never really believed he had to deliver on that. He needed something to offer to, uh, to his uh, Eurosceptic um, uh, colleagues in his own party. And he thought it was probably safe to offer a referendum in 2017 because Cameron probably didn't quite think he would have to deliver on that promise. You know that Britain has a history of promising referenda on all sorts of European issues that never happen. And had Cameron continued his coalition with the Liberal Democrats, of course, he would have had a blend a splendid um, excuse for not holding that referendum because the Liberal Democrats are very Europhile. Unfortunately, David Cameron won the election, now he has to deliver. Um, so Cameron promised the impossible. He wanted to hold a referendum, he wanted to have substantial renegotiations on European law, a new treaty, everything uh, done quickly, of course, as always happens in Europe. Not. Um, and he wanted to have a completely reformed EU at the end of it. Cameron negotiated, of course, now for half a year. What he got is practically nothing. He has to sell this as a great success, whether his party will follow him, completely different matter. Um, it pretty much depends on where this euro crisis is going, where the migrant crisis is going, where the um, euro crisis itself, the monetary crisis is going. And then it depends in the end on his own party, whether anyone really dares to challenge the prime minister on his um, deal which is really not worth celebrating, or maybe in the end it depends on Rupert Murdoch whether the press um, gives Cameron a harsh treatment on this. But if Britain pulls out, of course, it will have implications for the rest of Europe. And I'm in two minds about Britain's um, departure or possible departure from the EU. As a Eurosceptic and as someone who shares a lot of the concerns of many British Eurosceptics, um, I can understand why they want to pull out. As a German observer, I hate the thought of the Germans being left alone with the French um, I think <laughs> for many reasons uh, the uh, British membership of the European Union was a good thing because it was a counterpart to this very etatist, um, statist view of the world that you find on the continent, so it was great to have Britain involved. But um, that's perhaps not good enough a reason for Britain to stay. Um, and then we have to talk about Europe's migration crisis. And um, I should perhaps start by saying that ageing Europe of course needs migrants to make up for the shortfall in workers. Um, in, in the labor markets and fill gaps in the labor markets, but um, the focus has to be on qualified migration. The problem with current uh, refugee migration into Europe is that not much of that is really qualified. The German Federal Labor Ministry um, estimates that about 10% of the migrants that uh, Germany currently gets as refugees um, will, be able, will be able to integrate themselves into the labor market, which means 90% will stay on welfare. Well, that's, that's not good for them, that's not good for Germany, it's not good for social cohesion. Um, but it kind of links back to a historical problem. Europe has never been particularly good at attracting qualified migrants and um, attracting the migrants that it gets. Other countries, including New Zealand, Australia probably, the United States, Canada probably have much better track records because they were much more careful to select the migrants that would actually contribute positively to society. European countries, I think, have never been particularly good at that. Um, 
just look at the German guest worker scheme of the 1950s and 60s, um, a complete disaster because the pretense was always that these people would just return at some stage um, and everything would be fine. And then when they stayed and people realized that they now had guest workers of the third generation, um, they realized they had a bit of a problem. But anyway, back to the migration crisis. Um, what we currently see is that there is um, enormous pressure on Europe's external borders, um, basically on the borders of the Schengen zone. The Schengen zone that allows pa passport-free travel within Europe. And it has um, basically led to um, the Dublin III regulation, which forced European member states, European Union member states to process uh, refugees in the first country that accepted them. So that should have been you know, Greece and Italy and Spain. That Dublin III Accord does no longer hold, so these migrants are basically passed on now to the countries where they really want to go, which is basically Germany and, to a lesser degree, Sweden. Now, I should tell you a bit about um, Germany's particular um, border policy in a few pictures. And what you can see here is, of course, the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, uh, having selfies taken with refugees. And um, that was all on the 4th of September, or around the 4th of September. That was the night when Angela Merkel decided to open the German border to a Syrian refugee stuck on the Balkan route in Hungary. So there were thousands of Syrian refugees um, at a railway station in um, Budapest. And they couldn't move uh, forward or backwards. And Angela Merkel basically said, we're opening the border. But that was taken as a signal to everyone, not just Syrian refugees, but basically North African um, would-be migrants that Germany is now open for business and we should all come. So all that migrants thought they had to do was kind of take the detour via Turkey, take a boat across um, Greece. Greece would wait there with buses and just bus them straight to Germany. That was roughly what was happening. Now Merkel probably didn't intend that, but that was a signal that arrived because these selfies, they spread via social media. And migrants and would-be migrants, they are on Facebook and Twitter and they saw these pictures. And so what Merkel really triggered was a wave of migration. Um, supported also by um, a Willkommens Kultur, the welcome culture that you can see in that second picture where Germans appeared on train stations and rolled up big welcome banners because they wanted to show the world that they are no longer the Nazi Germans that, you know, occasionally gas people, but now they welcome them with um, <laughs> soft toys and, and the like. Um, so for Germany, this was a way of showing that the country has actually changed. And I mean, as such, that's positive. It's, it's great. I mean, it's wonderful that German civil society actually showed that it was willing to do something positive. But the way it was done didn't work because what it did was what you can see on the bottom two pictures. It triggered more migration. It triggered um, hundreds of people drowning now on the way to Germany that would have otherwise stayed in, in Turkish refugee camps or in Lebanese refugee camps. So despite all best intentions, I think this policy is catastrophic, even for the migrants themselves. And Germany doesn't quite know how to deal with that. The other problem that has uh, actually led to are the Cologne attacks. You might have heard about what happened on New Year's Eve in Cologne. Well, um, I was in Germany at the time it happened, and I can tell you that it dominated the news for more than a week. Um, on New Year's Eve, about 2,000 migrants, um, refugees among them, gathered in the city of Cologne, just outside um, Central Station and the Cologne Cathedral that you may know, and started basically attacking everybody who happened to be there at the time, stealing mobile phones, robbing people, and um, crucially sexually assaulting lots of women. So until the present day, we have um, 1,100 reports of crimes committed that night. And these were just the reported um, crimes. Half of them are sexual assaults, uh, including three cases of rape. and. Bizarrely, the Cologne police the next morning issued a press release saying it was a wonderful, peaceful New Year's Eve. And it took days until the public realized what really happened. But when the public realized what happened and when they found that there were refugees among them, people who had only just arrived a couple of weeks before, it triggered a massive debate on cultural values um, and whether they had different ideas of um, you know, rights of women, for example, tolerance. And even left-leaning German publications like um, Spiegel Magazine or Süddeutsche Zeitung had um, cover stories that you wouldn't have seen before. Spiegel Magazine um, says auf der Kippe, meaning it's uh, on a knife's edge or it's um, at a tipping point. Süddeutsche Zeitung, it's probably the most um, center-left uh, broadsheet in Germany, had this cover, which, I mean, you can all kind of figure out what that is, a black hand touching a white woman. Now, the paper afterwards apologized for it, rightly so, because it was obviously racist. But it, if, if a newspaper can run such cover stories, you can see how the mood's tipping in the country. And interestingly, also, Focus magazine, who it's a center-right news magazine, ran this cover story. What it says at the bottom is, um, sind wir noch tolerant oder sind wir schon blind? Are we 
still tolerant or are we just blind? So something has happened in the vote in Germany. It has actually increased the rise of the right-wing populist alternative for Deutschland. It's now scoring third in uh, German opinion polls. Something is happening in Germany that's destabilizing the political system because people have lost trust in the government's uh, refugee policies. 81% of all Germans in a recent opinion poll said they had lost trust in their government on that. Germany accepted 1.1 million refugees last year. Probably another 1 million are expected this year. And what we're now seeing is that European countries are completely divided on how to deal with the crisis. So Sweden has basically closed its borders. Um, Denmark has closed its. Um, they're becoming tougher on migrants. Austria has declared that they would only accept uh, about 35,000 refugees for this year. Nobody knows what's going to happen um, for the 31st, uh, for, for the next migrant after that. Germany is isolated within the EU because a lot of European countries are blaming Germany for the flow of migrants because they say, well, actually, you asked for it. You just send the signal that you would welcome everybody. Merkel's popularity in free fall, I'm not convinced that she will stay chancellor for much longer. The real problem, I think, for Germany politically, domestically, is the rise of right-wing populism. So the alternative for Deutschland seems to be well established now. But it's really driving the European Union apart. They can't, f can't find a common policy on migration anymore. And the Schengen Agreement, which I would argue is one of the greatest achievements of the European Union, is basically suspended until further notice. So what we're seeing in total is a European Union that's completely disintegrating. And 2016 is not just a deja vu of the euro crisis. It's much more than that. It's not just a monetary crisis. It's not just a sovereign debt crisis. This crisis is really political. We have a European Union that's weakened already economically and structurally and institutionally for all the reasons that we know and that I talked about. But we're now facing a number of interrelated challenges. We are seeing resistance against euro policies. We have seen a division of the eurozone in countries that resist bailouts and countries that want more of that. Countries that resist austerity demands and countries that want more of that. We are seeing this rising nationalism, this Putin light style um, democracy in Eastern Europe, especially in Poland, Hungary and Slovakia. We are seeing a growing populism practically everywhere, including in countries outside the Eurozone. We have the real possibility of the, Brit of, of the UK, Britain leaving the EU, and we have a complete inability for Europe to solve um, the migrant crisis. So what can we expect from Europe? Well, I think the least we can expect for this year is political instability. That's both at the individual member states level, but also at the EU level. Um, just watch the Br Brussels summit um, this week. That's actually starting tomorrow. And you will see how disunited Europe has become. In previous times, they were always trying to look for compromises. There's not even a semblance of that anymore. It's basically one country, every country against each other country. We have massive um, doubts still about the Eurozone. The Eurozone, as I said, um, the crisis in the Eurozone has become chronic after all these six years. But just because it is chronic doesn't mean it can't become acute again. There are doubts about Europe's banking system in practically all countries, in all Eurozone member countries, uh, probably most acute in Italy. But look at what's happening to Deutsche Bank and you can see that um, even Europe's biggest investment bank is now serious in, in serious trouble. So what I think we can expect European companies to do in response is they will try to diversify their investment positions. They will try to get out of Europe because I think that's the best thing that anyone can do. Guess why I'm here. Um, and basically, it's uh, don't expect anything positive from Europe because Europe will just be too busy dealing with its present rather than to develop its future. So 2016, it's the end of the EU as we knew it. And I don't feel fine. As a Eurosceptic, as someone who's been criticizing the European Union for all these years in so many different columns, as Roger mentioned, um, it doesn't give me any ple pleasure really talking about this because I'm still, well, I was born in Europe, my, my parents are still there, my friends are in Europe. Um, I feel really angry, I feel sorry, I feel um, no pleasure in dealing with this crisis. There is no schadenfreude, even though it's a German word. Um, but it's, it's really awful what's happening because the European Union, for all its failings, it was still a project that enabled a common market, that helped to heal some divisions of the past, that was able to do some sensible things like the Schengen Agreement. But this European Union, all the good things about the European Union, Union which were there as well, they are under threat as well. And certainly the destabilization of European democracies, the rise of populism, the rise of really nasty right-wing, in some cases, anti-Semitic parties is nothing that um, gives me any pleasure at all. Unfortunately, that's all I have to say tonight. There's nothing more positive about this. The European Union might survive, but even if it does, it will be a very different union. Thank you.
though he's suffering under the heat of the it lights. It's uh, bloody hot here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just flown in this afternoon from Australia, um, where he caught a traveller's bug. Um, Oliver has uh, agreed to take questions, so uh, he will field them himself. And uh, what housekeeping matters did I have to deal with that I forgot when I started? Somebody could give me a glass of water, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> a, a glass of water, please. And uh, we haven't had any of the, the minor tremors we've been... Oh. Feeling all week. I was no. to tell you that that was Thank you. David Jones Thank you. demolishing the last of Kilcaldi's downstairs <laughs> and not the panic, but it feels like we're safe. So yeah. we'll open the floor. Yes. One thing you didn't mention was the existing trade agreements within the European continent with, say, Switzerland, mm -hmm. countries which are not EU countries. Yep. Um, that seems to me to be quite a good option for particularly Britain. Um, I understand the, the cost of the trade agreement in contributing to Belgium's yep. improved bureaucracy, um, that it's about a third of the cost uh, with no, and they choose which laws they want to manage their own borders and sovereignty. What do you think of that? In principle, it's a nice idea. The problem is, of course, that if you are talking to Swiss people, they will tell you that um, they don't get much choice. They are basically forced to implement a lot of European legislation without having any input into the directives because they're not sitting at the table. Um, have a look at how the European Union routinely deals, deals with Switzerland, how much pressure they put on Switzerland. Um, they probably wouldn't be able to do the same with Britain because Britain is bigger. Um, yeah, basically, you're right. And I think the, the, the sad thing is that the wrong system won, because in the beginning there were two European associations. There was EFTA, um, that was the European Free Trade Agreement, and that was basically just about a, um, well, a free trade zone for Europe. And there was the European Union that always was a bit more ambitious and tried to uh, unify Europe and try to establish political union. Um, if you ask me, I think the wrong, wrong association won. It would have been much nicer had EFTA expanded around Europe and just established a free trade agreement and maybe a customs union, something like that. Maybe with a Schengen agreement on top of that. But unfortunately, they went for political union, for monetary union, for all the wrong things. Um, yeah. Is it too late to change? Yes. Because um, the European Union is so well established and um, it's just such an inertia in the system. It's path dependent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, the option is there, but it will take a long time and it will be messy in the meantime. I think it's too early to go into Europe expecting that now. Frankly, I think the next few years, maybe decades, will be too tough for Europe to just sort out this mess before we actually talk about any opportunities again. And I'm not even con convinced that um, we will see a return of Europe um, in this century because um, the problems are so enormous. So think of um, demographic change, aging. Germany in the 2030s will reach a median age of above 52 years. I mean, how are you going to generate significant growth out of that? It's practically impossible. The, the, the aging is not even spread. That's true. Um, and uh, that aging is um, uh, looking a bit better in countries like um, Britain and France because they also had higher birth rates. But um, I'm, I'm not that optimistic. Maybe Britain, if they pull out, there might be an opportunity. And Britain's doing relatively better than Europe anyway. Hmm?